Hi, good afternoon, good morning, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to the second part of the So, um, yeah, I'm, what I'm going to do is a brief, a very brief presentation on what Westify is and about how it works. I'm going to do some practical demos of using Westify. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll blow your mind into how awesome it is and how simple it is. And then once I've blown your mind, hopefully you can stick it back together again and come up with some ideas of where to go next and possibly even volunteer to help with where to go next uh, in the hack deck. So, have you ever created a graph? And this is the same question I asked earlier, so it's more than that. Question you're not going to know the answer to me, but have you ever created a graph or another output and come back to it a little bit later, whether it's five minutes later or whether it's five weeks, five months, five years later, and gone, how the hell did I create that graph? Where did the data come from? What version of my code am I using? And be really, really stuck when you couldn't do that. So I, I don't know if anyone else this problem. I had this problem when writing my PhD thesis. I wanted to include a really awesome graph in my PhD thesis, but I had no idea how I created the graph. Apart from the fact that it looked really awesome, it really, really well demonstrated what I wanted to show about how awesome my algorithm was, apart from that, you know, how I created it. And so you're kind of you're maybe you've got an awesome, maybe this is your awesome graph, it's going to win you the Nobel Prize. But there's two problems. They don't give Nobel Prizes for graphs where you don't have in the caption what data was created from. And they also don't give Nobel Prizes for graphs that don't have y-axis labels. Uh, so you kind of want to know what code you've created from it, so you can run it again with a little bit in there saying, put a y-axis label on there. So, this kind of comes down to two sort of aspects. One is the, the idea of problems, knowing what was used to create what, where it came from. So if you're, you started with this data, you did x, y, z, a, b, c, and out came this output. The other is the idea of electronic lab notebooks. So when you're in a, in a sort of wet sciences lab, when you're sitting in a biology lab or chemistry lab doing things with test tubes and beakers, people tend to be very good at keeping a, a, a handwritten of often notes about what they did. I did this with this, and did this, and this, and this, and this, and then it blew up, and then they got evacuated, and, and so on. Um, people tend to be very good at doing that with computational science. And actually, a lot of that should be done automatically. But it doesn't really work very well, there's a lot of extra work you have to go through. So this, this is where the idea for Westify came, and Westify, uh, the idea was, was established almost exactly a year ago at Collaborations Workshop 2015, with a focus on putting two criteria. One is to be easy. People don't want to go to effort to do this stuff. So the easier you can make it, the less effort you can make it, the better. And the other is to work with as many sort of linings and so on as possible without having to modify the libraries themselves. So if I have to go to every author of every kind of scientific library and say, please modify this and put a bit in here that will work with, with less of they they can say, no, we don't care, it's not used enough, we're just not going to do it. So you wouldn't work with libraries and all that stuff. So this is what we put together in terms of best buy. Uh, this is us last year, um, with, with Raquel who's down here, and Yannicka who unfortunately isn't here, but you can see the way the direction of the Netherlands, I guess, is kind of that sort of direction. Um, so, yeah, we, uh, we came up with this as a collaboration project for Hack Day. Uh, we won the Hack Day, with our uh, tablet that in there. And since then, we've uh, presented it at Euro Science Time, we've done quite a lot more, more work on it, it's got quite a bit of traction. So, I said this is probably simple to use. This is the user manual for the SMI. <laughs> this is the single line of code that you need to add to the top of your Python script. To get Westify to do all sorts of awesome things with it. So, if you've got a script like this, this is a fairly standard Python script. Um, so, what we're doing here, uh, we're reading some data using pandas, we're plotting some data, you know, plot and saving it out to a graph. Um, we are then, for some reason, modifying the temperature by 100, don't know why we're doing that, but we are, um, and we're sticking it out into, a, into an application file. Very simple example of the use this. You stick import Westify at the very top, so before you import anything else, right back at the top, um, you get all sorts of cool things happening. I'm now going to show you the cool things that are happening. While I'm trying to get around to the right place in my workshop, this is going to be fun. Let's see. So, can people still hear me? Yeah. Good, that's the right answer. Quite a few things. Question. Yes. What about from the for division? Because that has to be the first line. Good point. Uh, should be fine. Okay. Remind me to put, put a test for that. Uh, right, so can you see this? Let me just, right, so what I've got here is uh, exactly that Python script. So, 
So we've got to import those files from, and then we've got the things that we in our files and, and save that file. And what happened with that? Yep. So if we run this script, you can see we get a little bit of in output uh, saying that a Restify run has been created. So this is just saying that Restify has noticed that you've run this script and it's given it a unique ID. So this is a really one and it's globally unique uh, and you prefer to this particular app. Now if we look in our um, folder here, you can see we've got things like bar.png, and if you open up bar.png, you can see our like, graph. Now imagine that you come back to this and you go here, like, how can I create bar.png? What you can do is you can use the Restify command line tool to do Restify search for the start of the page. And you get some output like that. So you can see here that you've got my ID, probably who created it, when. It tells you what script you ran, you <coughs> what Python interpreter. It tells you the git commit of the repository. So that, if I go to this example script, is in a, in a git repository. Uh, in that repository, particularly um, here it says there's no origin because there isn't uh, an origin set to get the repository because we've come from Git or something and the origin is set there. Tells you the platform and most importantly, tells you what your inputs and your outputs are. You can also bang, do a bit more with this with a kind of user interface with one left by GUI. Uh, something that's inside the moment, you've only got one line in there, but you can see the same thing uh, there. You've got more information, you can even add. Some notes here if you want to, to sort of annotate your, your run. Um, you can do a similar thing, uh, oops, sorry, a similar thing from the um, command line. You can say, oops, you know, uh, you can say uh, this run works. Uh, that's very much like this is way you can do it. If you make it load up in it, you some stuff in it, you write some stuff over and save it. And now if we search for graphs of PSG, you can. Um, See the notes in there as well. Now, if we were to run this again, you see it accepts another Restify run ID, and if we again do our search saying what created from it, it says that both of the previous runs creating the same output have been, have been seen, and run with all to show. So we can run with the options all, and you can see one of those things is not working, or one of those apart from that one. Very similar to all the dates and items and IDs and so on. That's very basic Restify usage, and it shows how that can really be quite powerful. So you, you, it's got all these hooks in it, it's hooked into where you've got input files and output files, and it's stored all this in a database. So let's just look very briefly at how this actually works. Is that not uh, Yes. So, um, I can actually see what you're doing and see your faces. Um, so, what we've got here is the sort of important bits of our, of our script highlight. So, the import Restify does basically the setup of, of, of Restify. It creates a sort of, it creates this run, it installs all the different bits into the sort of like, interpreter that Restify then uses to do its work. And then every function that is in a pipeline that does input or output is monkey patched. Now, monkey patching um, in this case basically means going into code that's already been written and sort of wrapping it. If it other code, you know, does something else before it does its original job. So now, when you, once you import a Restify, when you call read CSV from Pandas, before it actually goes off and reads the CSV, it, it calls it a Restify function going, hey, look, the fact that we're reading something using this function from this file. And Restify scores that data. And the same thing happens with the same thing for, for output and, and the two CSV for output, and then all of the other standard input output functions and things like Pandas, Matplot, Lint, Unpy, and, and so on. Uh, once we're in the database, we're using a NoSQL uh, database at the moment. Um, we started off with Hack Day last year using uh, MongoDB. That's a little bit, that's very useful, it can be easy to share things across multiple computers, you've got you know, good scalability. Uh, it was a bit complicated to get things set up for that, um, when you just to new people to it. So we're actually using a pure Python database like from TinyDB. And then basically, the database you just go out to your Mongo or your GUI <coughs> interfaces to query what you Done. So the real magic, except the magic, happens in these monkey monkey patch docs. Now, if you want me to go into more detail about how those work and how simple it is to extend Restify to work with other libraries, things like Astro Pi or um, things like a data handling library like GDAO or whatever it is that you can use to do things like data free Python, uh, 
Uh, it's actually very easy, I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Um, before I do that, I can show a couple of other examples. Um, so, Westify is becoming, and it's become more mature, it's got things like configuration files and all sorts of fancy things like that that we didn't have in the collaborations workshop last year. Um, so, if we actually edit the configuration file all around the screen, oh, no, what's going on there? Is that right? Yeah. I don't know what. I mean, why does that do different things? Hang on a second. Sorry, I can't mind that. I can't see what I'm like. Yeah, it's There's a big screen. <laughs> Is there? Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, just one second. Oops. Uh, the documentation on the GitHub page at the moment, we're working with a bit of proper documentation 
this site set up, we're going to be reading the image a bit too long, and now we have all the options in the, in the configuration files and so on. Uh, please do go to uh, the GitHub repo and pull request out issues, suggestions that don't work properly. Uh, and also, the last four months in there, one of the things that we're trying to work at the moment is some really proper auto testing of this going on, because as you might imagine, testing something that hooks so deeply into the way that Python reports modules and so on is quite challenging to test effectively in a sort of standard testing framework. Um, so I think a little bit more complicated. And uh, yeah, feel free to contribute um, code, contributing to make money, contributing to also debate. Uh, I'll pay some work on this, be my guest. Um, and also, I will put this uh, link on um, Slack and Roman Group Back to Hell, put the link on Slack. Um, We've got a brief survey that after we had discussions on, we wait for people to turn out about some of the sort of which you've used before, what you did, what you might use in, what sort of features you might like adding, uh, which means you should help focus on the development effort. We've got quite a small team at the moment, and quite a lot of cool stuff that could be done. So I'm going to kind of stop, stop talking a bit there and move around, and basically say, does anyone want to, let's have a discussion, if you want to say anything about what we think of this? Yes. I think this looks really, really cool. So, um, Unless I might have missed something, I was typing at the same time on one thing. Um, what, what the, what's stored in the database is the name of the file that gave you the output. So, 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 so when we get this new version release, what we store will be the, the, the name, name and the hash. The, name, the, the input the name and the hash of all the input and output. Okay. Box. So, if, say, I <coughs> don't have that file anymore, yeah. then recipe. Just tell me the name of the bar that I know and hash that I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So one of the features that we're looking for implementing and that I think is on the list of uh, features that people might be interested in on this survey is to store the contents yeah, of input files, assuming that your input files are useful size, obviously. So there'll have to be a configuration thing there because you know a lot of my input files are terabyte size satellite images. Now that's probably not a great idea to think in the database. Um, but if you've got a but the script to analyze them, that, that might have always been. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so, so that's the other thing as well, is that um, at the moment it's it's predicated on the fact that you're using version control and that your script will be version control. Yeah. Now the one thing I didn't demonstrate in fact that I can demonstrate in a moment is that it lists all diffs between the script that is run and the latest version in the repository. Why do that as opposed to we're gonna get loads of hashes now. Why do that as opposed to getting the hash that corresponds to the, the version? Not the hash of the file, but the, but the git hash. Yeah, so we do get the git hash. I do get the git hash. So, yeah, so if you look at the Sorry if I missed it. No, no, it's fine. Um, it takes a difficult for me to demonstrate this on the other way, but just it's not easy to my app. But, um, ah, I see it, I see it. Yeah, yeah. great. So, see the hash up there. The interesting example, I'll put this down a second, um, is if we, for example, uh, modify this to, for example, on the Raspberry Pi multiplying by 1000, let's take off yeah. 273, sorry, we've got a bit more sense because we know we've got a and run that again, yeah. and then look at the latest environment with, <coughs> with the option to show dips as well. Well, you can see that it tells us uh, oh. up here that we're using git commit such and such. Cool. But, but then also it tells us that the difference between it is that we got rid of the plan for and we've gone to the minus two separate way. Because this is one of the big issues that I have, and some of you may well have as well, is when they're actually doing some live investigation of their code, they don't commit every time they run a different version that produces an output. Because otherwise, every time you run anything tiny bit to, to test it or play around with it, you couldn't get commit every five seconds. So it needs to install this, this difference. Uh, yep. 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 Can I suggest um, a slightly different way of solving the problem, perhaps? Um, have you ever thought about just embedding the, the script in the image? So that's another thing. Really Steganography really style. I mean, I, I use that in Flickr all the time. You can actually use Flickr as just file storage because you can just upload images um, and put anything you want in the image file, essentially. Yeah. So we looked into that's another thing that's also on our, our list of features is storing either the Script, well, it's some combination of the rest of my run ID, the script, Depending this kind of output yeah. of, of, of the kind of run as metadata in the file itself. So, depending on the file that you're outputting, um, as you said, lots of image files to store the kind of metadata, so many PDFs, so many various stuff like image data. It's not just metadata, you can store the actual file. You can have like a 5 megabyte CSV file, you can 
she's the hit inside the dead yeah. thing. Me. It's a hat. Yeah, I say so many yeah. things that there's also the possibilities there. If you start sticking five way by CSV files inside game, it's like magic and some programs that then probably don't play nicely with that. So. But the advantage of that, if you share that JPEG with someone else, they don't need to have your Recipe info. So it, it's basically all within the one file. Yeah. It's kept together. It's not separate systems. You know, it's yeah. all within the one file. Yeah, so I think it's definitely possible to do that. I think there's a lot of, a lot of these things will work well or not so well for different sorts of users, different people in different sorts of work. Right? So I suppose the issue with that as well is the usability of it. Like, depending who you give that file to, they might or might not. You know, when you say, oh, the code to run it is in the image, I, I can think of multiple colleagues who would have absolutely yeah. no idea what you mean. Yeah. Well, it's 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 the JPEG. <laughs> yeah. Well, so the main thing may be that there's then sort of potential for some sort of, uh, um, some sort of other, you know, command within Webify that says, take the, take the output file to just have an embed stuff into it. So you've actually got, you've got your more data into like 10k, and then you've got your Wi-Fi data into yeah. all the stuff in it. Uh, okay. yep. Uh, Robert, could you slowly and using easy words explain the interaction between Git and uh, version control and RESPI? Yeah, okay, so you have your code in a Git repository. Um, you've worked on a new feature for your code and you've done it in Git, okay? Um, you then make some minor changes change a few parameters or whatever and run a script which will do some output simulation or whatever. Um, Recipe will then grab from the Git repository what particular version of the repository it is. It will also grab any of the differences between the latest commit and what you've got and what it is that you're actually running at that time. And I don't have to set it up. It's magically going to be. It's magically going to work as long as your script that you're running is in a Git repository. You don't force me to go back to the Git repository. What if it isn't? Because I'll run it as a Sorry? What if it isn't? Well, if it isn't, it will just not store anything to do with Git. Okay. Because but it will still tell me the input files. It will still tell you everything else, it just won't have Git. And one of the other things that is on the list of possible features for people to, depending on the surveys, support the other version control systems that people are. Using the Yoda or some version or whatever. Yeah, just just for you. Anyone else want to make anything or, or say anything? No, nope, carry on. So I, um, I have two. But the short one is no. Yeah, I got them again. Uh, what dependencies does this have? So it has um, a fair few dependencies actually now, um, but they're all pure Python and easy to install. <laughs> Yeah, so the Git, the Git Python library, um, the web in the GUI is done through Flask. Um, we'll probably make it so there's an option to install. We might make it so there's actually a better by package than a better by GUI package. Yeah, yeah. So if you don't want to deal with all the things on Flask and yeah. the various Flask dependencies, you don't have to. Um, apart from that, up, you know, my wife is just providing me the requirements for this. Um, yeah. <laughs> in fact, that probably should be on next round, but it isn't dependency. Six and TinyDB and DocOps and a few other very simple. Yeah, they're, they're all. Yeah. Um, and just the final one. So when I when I run it, I've never used Recipe on my machine before, and I put an import Recipe mm -hmm. in there. The first thing it does, I'm guessing, is it creates the database. Yes. And is it a separate? It's a separate database for each repository, or do I have one Recipe? No. So, so um, you, by default, you need to create a Recipe. They put a database in dot uh, Recipe in your home directory. Okay. Um, so it's a folder there, which shuts a load of stuff in like databases. Um, you'll notice the um, file I showed earlier called the uh, config file can specify locations of the database, and any config file that is in the folder that you write your script for takes precedence over any local type. Yeah, exactly. So you can go set the database for that. Uh, you can also say that for you know, this repository, yeah. for example, in the future, this repository that I wanted to store all of the input files, this repository I don't want to store any store of the input files because they're this was only wanted to hash my output files because I might write down my output files and they they can't have out hash or <coughs> cool. Yes. Uh it works with all versions of Python. Yes. Um let me let me follow that. It works definitely with 2.7 onwards, the 2.3. Um I don't think I'm testing with 2.6, so but if you do 2.6 you can have some. Um, <laughs> basically. Uh, 
Yes. So, I mean, please do obviously the, the survey that you're writing. Have you shown the survey that you're Yep, perfect. Uh, please do follow that in. Just kind of in terms of a show of hands for people who are actually here. Do people think this is interesting, useful, might yeah. use it? I've just installed it. Okay, how are you? It's someone installing it. Well, well when we, when I, the year before I, I did the Best Buy Hack Day, we did a, a web app thing. And while we were presenting it at the end of the hack day, someone in the audience realised the security issue with our web app and hacked into it live while we were demonstrating it. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so if someone installing it is better than someone hacking into it and saying, you really ought to you know, do this better in terms of cost price quickly or whatever it was. <laughs> did, you, did you mention notebooks? Can you use that? Uh, so, notebooks, yes, you can, but it needs a bit more work to make it. Make it not. Um, we don't want to look at the diff, right? That was <laughs> no. I mean, it's yeah. Well, yeah. That's one of the big problems in large is that big problems in large. Big problems in the in the in the world movement world is that notebooks aren't aren't visible very nicely. Um, it does work, and there are in fact ways to use a, a specified uh, log init function uh, or new or something like that to kind of like the list and force it to create a new. Set the environment set where I and go from there. So if you're, if you're not running all of your imports and so on in the local tool, you can say, okay, start from a new place, say this is a new bar, you can do that sort of manually in a local cell. In the future, I suspect there will be some things like some Jupyter magic from the I want to get some things about this. Um, we do have not quite happened yet. <laughs> Great, I think we've seen you turn it up for what could be the next session, so I should probably shut up now. But thank you very much. Mm. Right. <laughs>